Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Madison Realty Capital, New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Amtrust Title, Ariel Property Advisors, Customers Bank, Capital One Bank, Meridian Capital Group. Additional funding has been provided by grants from AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Colliers International NYC, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization Handro Properties, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Castamatidis Red Apple Group, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Meringoff Family Foundation, the Moynian Organization, Moynian Capital Partners, and these friends. Yonkers, New York. I mean, what? A, a, Ten out of twelve kids. What a small little Irish family. Guy doesn't know anything about cooking. Self-taught cook. Iron chef beats Bobby Flay. Runs the best restaurant in Westchester. I have Peter Kelly. Oh, I failed to say also the proprietor of a leading vodka, which we will have later on. So well, we're gonna, what are we waiting for? No, no, no. It's, it's, it's <laughs> the end. It's the end of the show. Okay. So tell me about. The grandparents. So on my father's side, um, they came in, you know, they're immigrants from uh, Clare, County Clare in Ireland, came in through Canada. I'm Did sure, you, I'm idea, sure legally. Any idea here, why they ended Ellis up in Island. Canada? Did they have relatives there? Uh, they, they did. They, they knew somebody. I, don't th I, th I think there was some friend from the area from Clare. So this is grandpa? Yeah, this is my grandfather. Came here, settled in Yonkers. Any idea why Yonkers? What would, you know, that's like another county in Ireland, Yonkers, especially in those days. But um, I, I don't know how they found it, but they found it. Thank goodness. So that was Grandpa. Okay. That was Grandpa. And, and then uh, on my mother's side, they were from uh, Long Island, sort of Long Island, the Rockaways, that area, Breezy Point area. That's cool. He was a doctor. Oh, he was a doctor? He was a doctor. His brother was a priest. His twin brother was a priest. Right. And uh, he, they managed to have, my grandparents, eight children, six of which went into the clergy. Dad, you told me, went to college. He was yeah. in the Navy. Yeah, he went to Fordham. Um, was studying in the priesthood at Cathedral for a while also, but then was enlisted in the uh, Navy and uh, worked in naval intelligence and uh, pilot in the Navy. So. And then he comes back to Yonkers. And he comes back to Yonkers. Um, I guess he stopped in Long Island first to pick up my mother. But how did he meet her? This was the Yonkers guy, and Breezy Point was the Queens guy. Okay. Well, so that was the lace curtain. My mother was lace curtain Irish, and my father was shanty. What, what is lace curtain? Oh, wait. It was you had lace curtains Yonkers. in your windows. Right. My mother's family, you know, father was a doctor and a professional, and they lived out at the beach. That's where their home was. My father's family used to spend a week or two out at the beach in the Rockaways in the summertime. That's where they met. My, my father always said, who was a Kelly, Francis Kelly, my mother was uh, Harriet Murphy. She went from bad to worse. She went from being a Murphy to a Kelly. So, um, so when was, did mom and dad uh, get married? So I guess they got married in the, uh, in the 50s. They had 12 kids in about uh, 20 years. 
you know, we got a, a twin set in there, so. Okay, and now you said to me, Dad became a life insurance salesman, or at that time, a death insurance salesman. Right, he worked for uh, Mutual of Omaha as a life insurance or the, death the, insurance. The Lion King, the Lion. Exactly, it, Wild Kingdom. Wild, Wild Kingdom. Wild Kingdom, we watched it, we had to. It was required of us. It's part of that. <laughs> But yeah, he he uh, he worked. He always had a second job, also doing something or other to uh, you know make sure there was enough uh, enough dinner. Now when, there never when was. You, when you moved most of us got in trouble and got sent to you know to our room without dinner at night because there wasn't any. Wait a second. You lived in the projects in Yonkers. At yeah, we did in Schlobaum in in Yonkers. Uh, for a couple, for a few years, um, you know. And then, how do you elevate to go to Croton on the Hudson? Well, that was um, a big deal in, in, in the uh, '63 or '64. My father found a house up in Croton. It was a sleepy little bedroom community, and uh, we were out in the country on Mount Airy Road. I mean, we had woods forever, and you know, found a big house up there. You know, I mean, we still still had to share a room. But it wasn't now five and six to a room. Besides the fact of the large family, it was like every week there was more priests oh, over there, uh, the Dominican priests, the Catholic priests. We, we, we had the nuns you know, over there. The Franciscans, we had, we, had, we had everybody. Nearly every weekend there was clergy at our house singing Irish ballads and uh, drinking teacher scotch and a little too much of all of that, I'm certain, although I was young. You were young. I was young. I was young. But, you know, we all went, um, you know, as everybody did in those days, to Catholic school, parochial schools. So let's talk from, about, you know. Because you moved from Yonkers when you were a young kid. I was in first grade. Okay, so you're in Croton and you go to a parochial school. Yes, Holy Name of Mary. Later on, you get to work in the paper wrap. Yeah. You, you yeah, built yeah. a successful paper wrap. Maybe that's. I did. Um, so in fifth grade, I get an, you know, you were allowed to work in those days young. Um, so I get offered this paper route that has no customers, but they're building um, Amberlands, which was this massive um, apartment complex just outside of Croton. And so um, I, I was paid by the Gannett News. It was the Citizen Register was a newspaper. They paid me uh, Fifteen dollars for every five new customers I got. That was a great. Uh... It was. I was making a fortune. I was making a fortune. So, um, you know, so I did that for years until there was, you know, I mean, in those days, everybody got the newspaper, the, and particularly the local newspaper. And so um, we never had any problem. I thought I thought it was a great salesman. You told me from the the newspapers, you also the, you had to put the papers together. Well, that was my next job. Right. So, so what happens is now I get an opportunity to work at a delicatessen. I'm, I'm, I'm 12 at the time and uh, 13, going on 13. And um, Jack and Nisi had a, had, a, had a deli, the Quick, the quick Mart. And it was, it was a tremendous business. And on Sundays, you know, the Sunday Times, you know, was, was this big. And each... They had Section, to put the sections together. came separately. Wait, and they used to come during the week. Okay, they some come, of them. They over would there. start coming on Fridays. Right. And then you had the Friday, and then you had to wait until Saturday morning. In the morning, right? That's right. And then, and so what would happen is that I'd go into work on Sundays at 4 a.m., and you'd snip all the things, get your set. You had your the wire stacks. cutters. You had, your, you, had, you, had, you had to have your wire cutters. And then, you know, you'd have the sports section and the, 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 you know, the living section and the real estate section and the so art it, section. So and is that how you got into food also? Well, because in the room I used to put all the papers together with, there used to be a pot that was as tall as me of meatballs because it was a deli and they sold meatball heroes. And there was always this huge pot going every single day in tomato sauce. There were terrific meatballs. I have to say, this is before meatballs became, you know, trendy. And, um, you know, we'd snatch a few meatballs here and there and uh, do the um, papers. But I got into food because, you know, from a big family, food was always an important thing because, because it was a big family, there was always a celebration coming up. It was either somebody's birthday or somebody's anniversary or First Holy Communion or a graduation. I mean, it was always something. And that meant we were gonna eat. 
good. Ham, you know, ham was, was a big one for us. Or, or uh, either fresh ham or a canned ham with the pineapple rings. And um, so it was, uh, so food was an was very import of, important part of our growing up. And so when I, later we moved again to Wappinger's Falls. So how old were you when you moved to Wappinger Falls? Ninth grade. My father died. Father had passed on. My father, I was in seventh grade. I was 12 when my father died. Um, and it was, you know, it was a big family. It was kind of, uh, it was sudden. He was young. He was only 51 years old. And uh, my mother, you know, just sort of took control of the household. And so now you're she had never worked. She went, she started working at, the, at that point. Um, we were, you know, oh, we were all old enough. I was 12. So the two younger than me were uh, eight and nine. So you went to, uh, went to high school in Wappinger Falls? I went to high school in Wappinger Falls, Roy C. Ketchum. And you were a wrestler, right? I wrestled through high school. I was much smaller then, 112 pounds wrestled at. It was a lot of work because I used to go to school, then go to practice, and then go to, to work. I found a job in a little German restaurant um, called The Forest House. It was a terrific restaurant. It was a woman chef owner. And she made literally every single thing. And she was so good to me. I mean, I used to go in and she would sit me up on a stool and feed me, you know, goulash soup or, you know, some spadesel before. So what, so what do you do at the restaurant? Wash dishes. I wash dishes. And I, and, I, and I watched everything that went on. And then, and then I had an opportunity. You know, I wanted to get out of the kitchen because all of the action was in the front with the guests. So I had an opportunity to go to a restaurant um, in Beacon called the Duchess Manor Restaurant. And it was an old school continental restaurant that used to do, you know, used to flambe ducks in the dining room and saute. I mean, the, 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 the chef was the, was the owner's son and who had just graduated from the Culinary Institute of America. And this is back in, I guess, 76, 75, 76. And um, I loved it. I mean, just used to work like crazy. So you, you were in the front of the house. I was in the front of the house, yeah. Got to wear a little bow tie. You know, I thought that was pretty cool. And is this, uh, so you graduated, you, you went to Marist College for a period of time. Yeah, I, I first started at uh, Dutchess Community. Did a couple semesters there, then uh, transferred to Marist. Um, I never finished um, because I just kept working. And as I was working, always a new opportunity was coming up. So tell me about some of the opportunities. Well, I worked at, I, I went to work at, uh, uh, right after they opened it at a restaurant run by two Swiss guys called the Plumbush. And um, right off the bat, I got three stars from the New York Times. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm in some fancy schmancy restaurant. I mean, this was like La Caravelle in New York or, or Lutez, you know, I mean, this was, and so I was there early so they needed people, and I knew the system, so I became a captain. And so I'm, you know, a young kid, 18 years old. I'm running the, making the schedule and running the floor and make, learned how to bartend and learned about wines and all this stuff. So from there, uh, other places, like I, I worked at the Arch in Brewster, which was very, very fine dining, still around f 40 years, one of, the, one of the oldest restaurants in Westchester. Um, a guy named George Seitz, uh, you know, Ran it, a German guy. So how do you decide to leave Westchester, the provincial Westchester, and come now to the Big Apple? Because now I figured, so I'm going to school at Marist and working. So I'm like working a full-time job. I'm going to school full-time. And I'm thinking, you know what? I love what I'm doing. I love this restaurant business. If I want to be good at it, I have to go to New York. So I decided I'm going to go into New York and I had about eight restaurants on my list. If I can get a job at one of these restaurants, I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna commit full time. So, you know, I went to La Tess and I went to Copasc and I went to La Perigo and I, I went to all of the restaurants that were the very top. And I was a little depressed because I, I kept going back to them week after week and say anything available. I was young. In those days, everything was, all the waiters were French. And um, they all spoke French. I didn't, and it was tough. It was a, it was a, it was a, a lot of it was the Bretons, and they, it was like a little 
a click that I couldn't break. And I'm walking past this restaurant, Laurent, which was on uh, 56th Street between Park and Lexington. It was an old guard restaurant, very, very fine restaurant, beautiful. And the clientele that I thought, wow. I mean, they, they, you walk through this lounge and everybody in the place, I mean, I'm looking at the shoes. I mean, there isn't a pair of shoes in those days that wasn't, you know, $400. I thought, wow, they're all drinking cocktails and they're going into the dining room and having dinner. So I applied, they hired me as a waiter. And at the same time, my brother, who had just graduated from Fordham, my brother Ned, he took a job at the Quilted Giraffe, which at that time, the Quilted Giraffe was the hottest restaurant in Manhattan. It was doing something new that the old school uh, French restaurants weren't doing yet. And the owner of Laurent was very curious about the Quilted Giraffe. So he would ask me, how is your brother doing over at the Quilted Giraffe? What, you know, does he like it? What are they serving? What are they doing? And we started talking, we created a relationship. In the mean, and so, so what happens is the owner of Laurent says to me, how would you like to be the youngest captain in New York? And I said, yeah, great. So he says, I'm going to mentor you. So, you know, the sommelier there, Renzo Rapscioli, um, and he worked so closely with me to sort of teach me about wine and food, how to take an order, how to, take, how to cater to a guest. I mean, it was an incredible clientele that used to, to go there. I mean, Salvador Dali was in the dining room all the time in those days. They, you had, um, I mean, every, every mover and shaker in New York. And so it was, um, it was great experience. So is that when you decided to become a chef? No. It's after the trip to Europe? Well, what happens is I decide I want to open my own restaurant now. I'm, I'm 23 years old or 22, 23, and I've, I've got a, you know, a, a, almost two years in at Laurent. I'm thinking, like, I could do this. And so... But you were only a front of the house. Right. So I had a guy. I had a, a chef, a young chef that I had worked with at the Arch. And I'm um, a very talented guy. And I said, I, I, I cut a deal on a country club up in Putnam County called the Highlands Country Club. And um, they had this space that they were not using. I said, I will take care of your food service, do your burgers and grilled cheese sandwiches and club sandwiches. Also let me run a restaurant. But I want a public restaurant. And so they agreed. I put my name, my middle name, Xavier, on it. It was Xavier's at Garrison. Um, and this guy was going to be the chef. We go out to celebrate. We wound up getting into a, a, a very stupid conversation about. I was explaining to him how I wanted to break the wall between the dining room and the kitchen, so that we could work together um, as as the chef and 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 the and the host of the restaurant. And he was like, "No, no, you you take care of the dining room. I'll take care of the kitchen. Don't worry about what I do. I don't need you to tell me what to do." And I said, it's not a question of me telling you what to do. I want, you, I want to tell you what the guests want and how they're interacting with the food and all this stuff. Anyway, we got into this big, ridiculous thing, and I said, you know what? I'm going to learn how to cook myself because I can't be at the mercy of anybody. And I remember at other restaurants, the chefs were crazy. And I, I, used, to, I used to think, like, how could that owner take that from that, that, that pastry chef just told him to get out of the kitchen? He owns the place. And I said, I never want to be in that position. And I said, I'm going to learn how to cook. And I did. I got the books out. Jacques Pepin taught me an awful lot. And you, you start running the restaurant. Now, at this time, Zagert? Well, so I, we opened in 83. Right. I was in the kitchen. And New York Times and Zagert? New York Times comes out with a big review saying we're great and all this stuff. And so I'm the 23-year-old, like, inexperienced, right. self-taught chef, Gets a four star from the New York Times. No, no not four stars yet. We got three stars. Three stars. Get, uh, Garrison. Yeah, and you get a 29 from Zagat. You get 29. When, when Zagat does their first book outside of Manhattan, they give us a 29. And Tim Zagat calls me beforehand and says, listen, I know you consider yourself a French restaurant, but we'd like to consider you a contemporary American restaurant. Because we didn't write our menus in French or anything. And he said, but in those... In those days, you didn't want to be an American restaurant because that wasn't where the cachet was. The right. cachet you was that you needed that French or continental or you know. Right. And I said, "Sure, I'm going to do that." 
David Boulay and I were the only 29s in the country. So what happens next? What's the next restaurant? I decided to open a, a restaurant in Rockland County, Xavier's at Piermont. This is 1987. And it's a tiny little jewel box of a restaurant, 40 seats, where I can really stay on top of the food and, 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 and touch, literally touch every plate that we serve. A big review comes and um, all of a sudden, you know, the, the, we're booked out, you know, two weeks in advance during the week and, and, and on the weekend, a month out. And I'm answering the phone in the kitchen. I mean, the, the phone is in the kitchen. I answer the phone. I check the coats. I, I, you know, it's, it, was, it was crazy, but it worked. We developed this, such a loyal clientele. They were very good to us. So when do you decide to go back to your roots of Yonkers? So we opened Xavier's at Piermont in 87. I opened the Freelance Cafe and Wine Bar in 89, which was, you know, I went to Italy and I was going to be Italian. And I thought, oh, I want to make it American. I want to. So we called it the Freelance Cafe. And so I could do a little bit from Italy, a little bit from a French bistro, a little American cafe. We did that. We got it off the ground. It was, it was, it was huge success. And then I wanted to open a larger restaurant. So Restaurant X and Bully Boy Bar in Congress, the, rest, uh, the Bully Boy had been around for 40 years. And um, the owner was tired, wanted to get out, and I took it and we redid it and opened that up. And it was a very large, 250 seat restaurant. And it opened up again to critical praise and all that kind of thing. So it was, we were happy. So we opened in 97, Restaurant X. In 2001. Right, at, right before 9-11. Right here. before. This was April of 2001, right after Easter. Um, I started looking in Yonkers because I think this is going to be a community that's going to come back. And I went down and I looked at the pier. There was an old recreational pier, dilapidated. I mean, people used to push their belongings in carts, and, you know, down there. It's where you went and, you know, got your, bought your drugs. And it was, it was a terrible neighborhood. But it was starting. Developers were looking at putting up housing. And, and it was literally right on the river. And you look across the river, the Palisades are completely protected. The Rockefellers did it. It's just beautiful across the river. You look south to the, to the uh, George Washington Bridge and north to the Tappan Zee. And, you know, it was just a beautiful spot. And I, I brought my brother Ned down to see what he thought. So we drive down through the soup of what was then Yonkers, and we get out to the river, and we're on this dilapidated open-air recreational pier. And he looked at me and he said, are you nuts? I mean, the family worked so hard to get us out of here. What are you gonna do, dra drag us all right. back now? So we opened 2007, um, Xavier's, and um, things are, go swimmingly. Um, and then I thought, how about some vodka? I had discovered the country of Slovenia um, through their wines and went and visited the country. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful country. And um, recognized as an Eastern European country, they had no vodka being made there. So I did some work on, um, on how to make vodka and found a manufacturer there that was making um, a, a walnut liqueur and said, do you think you could make this vodka for me? So we, I worked with the, the University of Ljubljana with buckwheat to see um, the properties of buckwheat because I wanted buckwheat as part of the vodka. Anyway, start working on a recipe. As, I'm, as product is coming back and forth, they're sending it from Slovenia back to me, the taste test and all this stuff. A friend of mine, Bill Murray, wanders into the restaurant and I said, Bill, you gotta try this vodka I'm working on. So of course we had a longer than we should have night. And how did Mikhail get involved? Uh, Mikhail Barishnikov, who was also a neighbor and friend, we needed somebody that really knew vodka. So, so I had the Russian take care of it. So I said okay. to Misha, you gotta taste this vodka and let me know. How do you end up on the Iron Chef and beat Bobby Flay years ago? I was lucky enough that they called me I, I think they were trying to set something up for Bobby. It was, the, you know, I get this call, and this is the Iron Chef. Will you accept the challenge? I said, sure. Come to find out. So I'm going to be facing Bobby Flay, and it's going to be Battle of the Grill. 
And Bobby had just released like his third book on grilling. So I said, oh, well, they're feeding me to the lions. You it's know? great that we have a picture of you winning and defeating him on Bobby Flay. Yeah. Even though you never went to the Culinary Institute, you were the keynote speaker for the Culinary Institute, the James Beard Award. James Beard Awards. I mean, I'm lucky enough to be uh, nominated there. And, you know, Culinary Institute of America, Tim Ryan at the Culinary Institute, I love the guy, but, they, you know, they invited me up to give the commencement. I mean, I never went there, so it was awfully nice <laughs> and gracious of them. The bar at the uh, Xavier's is called the Dillon Lounge? At X2O is the Dillon Lounge, my son. Um, and Dillon today works for Bloomberg? Yeah, he just graduated from uh, Cornell, and he, he works for uh, Michael Bloomberg. Okay, so. and let's talk about your wife. Uh, you were not taking cash in your restaurants? <laughs> My wife, Ricka, just celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary. I met her. She was working for American Express. We were a target of American Express because we, we never took credit cards, cash only. And then, of course, she came along and ruined everything. I also took her, though. So let's taste the vodka. Yeah. A bit. So this is my Slovenia vodka. Bill Murray is our ambassador of fun, and Misha is the ambassador of authenticity. And success. Cheers. And thanks for being here today. So nice to be here.